Thank you for being Thank you for being here. My name is Rachel Rosekind, and you are at day two of Abolitionist Visions and Intersections. Yesterday, we experienced powerful testimony and moving images. Presenters shared important learnings and questions about the role of reform in abolitionist movements and strategy, how hard people are working to connect those inside with resources, information, and education, the power of organizing to contest the shape-shifting many-headed hydra that is the Polynesia, the 13th Amendment, which can and does permit forced exploitable labor, the importance of changing our stories and challenging our stigmas and more. We live in a society with a massive amount of violence, a penchant for punishment and a lethal degree of preventable suffering. America has more poverty than any other advanced democracy. One in nine people lives below the poverty line and 30 million can't afford basic needs. Despite America's $26 trillion GDP in 2022, its poverty level has not significantly budged since 1970. It's therefore worth asking why in a country so affluent does poverty persist? Because if we're going to talk about abolitionism, we have to talk about poverty and racialized poverty in particular. Almost 30 years ago, California voters passed Prop 184, the three strikes law, kicking the carceral system into overdrive and simultaneously draining the coffers of social services and public universities. After its eye-popping financial projections were released, Governor Wilson said, I guess we'll have to reduce other services. We'll just have to change our priorities. It's notable that in the first six months of prosecution under the new law, African-Americans, which were 10% of the population, made up 57% of LA County's three strikes filings, 17 times the rate for whites, though contemporary data showed that white men committed at least 60% of the state's serious and violent crimes. The stark racial and economic disparities within our criminal punishment system are not accidental, they are architected. They are disadvantaged and divestment by design. So when will we creatively explore new terrains of justice and invest in resources and institutions that lift people up instead of pinning them down or hemming them in? When we truly believe that everyone deserves to live with dignity and freedom and provide equitable access to opportunities that allow them to do so. An architect addressed an audience and said, quote, it's tempting to frame possibility as an objective characteristic. The laws of physics tell us as architects what we can and cannot do, but that is an oversimplification. Possibility is always changing. New materials are developed that are stronger, lighter. Advancing technology allows us to test designs with increasing accuracy. Possibility is not objective, in other words, it is imagined. And the question of whose imagination we attend to is a deeply political one." End quote. As you listen today, I invite you to think about whose imaginations we are attending to in our collective campaigns and spaces. What new channels and possibilities can you open up inside yourself and begin to see and encourage in the world around you? Octavia Butler said, all that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. Believing in change is the root of abolitionism. Its branches are people moving into action with and in community. Today, we'll hear from some of them. So April, please open our first session. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. So again, welcome to the Abolitionist Visions and Intersection Summit. We are hosted by the American Library Association Social Responsibilities Roundtable, or CERT, which is much easier to say. CERT believes that libraries and librarians must center social responsibility by recognizing and helping to solve social problems and inequities to work for the common good. My name is April Shepard, and I am the co-coordinator of CERT, and I am joined by Rachel Roskind and Rebecca Black behind the scenes. Before we begin, I have a couple of quick housekeeping items. First, if you have not already done so, to enable captions, you can click more in the bottom right of your screen, then show captions. Our session is being recorded, and the recording should be on the CERT website probably sometime in early April. Please keep your cameras and mics off unless you are a presenter. Also, please be respectful and extend care and compassion to yourself and others. This includes using for person first language when posing questions or sharing information in the chat. Please refrain from using dehumanizing language such as prisoner, convict, or ex con, and instead use language which emphasizes the personhood of these populations, such as incarcerated person, justice involved individual, or justice impacted person, for example. 
Our first session today focuses on information access and curricular settings and contains two presentations. Please use the Q&A to pose questions and reserve chat to relay technical issues, resource sharing, and appreciation for our panelists. At the end of both sessions, we will get to the Q&As. So our first presentation is called Creating Continuity of Service, Returning Freedoms Through Library Services Behind Bars. This presentation will discuss what library services and access to information and carceral environments look like from varying viewpoints, including shared writings from currently incarcerated members of a prison library's writing club. The presenters for this session are Aaron Bluberg, a formerly incarcerated librarian who advocates for the rights of the incarcerated and other marginalized groups, and a member of the working group which updated the American Library Association's 2023 Standards for Library Service for the Incarcerated or the Detained. Brian Smith, librarian manager for the Chippewa Correctional Facility in Michigan. Suvi Manor, librarian at Kinross Correctional Facility in Michigan, where she started and facilitates a writing club that meets twice a month, allowing incarcerated writers to share their work and provide respectful critiques of each other. And their full bios are also available on our website. Thank you, everyone. You may begin. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Aaron Blumberg, and welcome to our presentation. I'm here along with my co-presenters, Brian Smith and Suvi Manor, and we are all former public librarians from Florida. I am also formerly incarcerated, where I spent three years in the Florida Department of Corrections, where I worked as an adult basic education teacher. A quick outline of our presentation. I will talk about my personal observations and experiences with library services while incarcerated, and talk about what continuity of service is and can be in carceral environments. We're going to follow this up with Brian Smith, who's going to discuss his time working in both the Florida and Michigan Department of Corrections, and we'll finish up with Suvia Manor discussing her institutional library's writing club. So welcome to, again to our presentation, Creating Continuity of Service, Returning Freedoms Through Library Services and Behind Bars. So I wanted to begin with some information on the Florida Department of Corrections and my observations of library services on the inside through the eyes of someone with the educational and vocational experience as a librarian. The Florida Department of Corrections holds the esteemed honor of having the most banned books in the prison system, over 20,000 titles. The Florida Department of Corrections allows for any institutional mailroom to arbitrarily ban materials. For their policies, once one mailroom denies a, a material, all of, it creates a department-wide ban. That means all institutions have to deny that material from coming in. If you were to appeal this denial, it goes through a lengthy grievance procedure, which ultimately is decided by a literature review committee. This committee is comprised of Department of Corrections Bureau Chiefs, chiefs none of which have any education or training to objectively decide if this denial or ban has merit. Of the reasons why a book has been banned, the most used reason is the publication otherwise presents a threat to security, order, or rehabilitative objectives of the correctional system or the safety of any person. This overarching reason is worded in such a way that it makes it impossible to challenge in any process, and which automatically creates a bias against any challenges. So carceral library services from my perspective as a user, as well as someone who came into the, the correctional uh, department with a background in libraries. Access is limited through use of a call out. A call out is a daily sheet that shows where you're supposed to go. If you do not sign up for library access, you do not get library access. Libraries are only accessible Monday through Friday during the daylight hours. If you have any job assignment that takes you in between those times, you can go. Otherwise, you are not allowed to access the library because your job takes precedence. As we talked about the 13th Amendment, these jobs are unpaid. I worked as a teacher without any pay. The way that Florida gets away with this is they say that you get to have good time which allows you to leave the prison earlier in your sentence. Institutional libraries are run by library technical assistants. 
These are people with no background in the educational work experience in libraries. The law library and the main library, both maintained by incarcerated clerks. The law library access and materials take priority. If the library were to have any kind of budget, the money is spent purely on the law library. The main library remains unfunded. The materials that are in the main library are outdated and donation based. That means that you have patrons that have donated the books that their families have bought for them and was able to get into the prison system. So once they finish reading it, they decide to donate or not those items to the library. There is no programming or access to professional librarians or library services. Any electronic resources are non-existent or and limited to law databases. Computer use is limited to accessing those law databases. Any eBooks that a patron may have access to is purely through their secure tablets. Here in Florida, those are Securus or JPay tablets, and they are in the public domain. That means that they have access to books that are in the 1800s to early 1900s. Educational materials are only allowed into the prison system if they are used in an approved educational course or program that has a sign off on both the education department director as well as the assistant warden of programming. So what do I mean by continuity of service and how do we create it? When I talk about continuity of service, I want to see continuity between the public library sphere, prison library sphere, and back to public. So everything that we can do in a public library, we want to continue that into the prison system and then continue it afterwards. So we want to make a experience in carceral library services that reflect those in the public library sphere. First steps to this can be found in the upcoming American Library Association's Standards for Library Services with Incarcerated and Detained. And we want to create carceral and public library partnerships to ensure that those being released can continue and expand upon their use of libraries. And finally, we want to stop the stigma. We do not know people's backgrounds in a public library sphere. And if we do, we have to still allow it to not affect their service. The same thing happens in carceral libraries. You may find out as a carceral librarian what someone's crime is due to the nature of, of helping them. We can't allow that to affect service. Our crimes do not define us. So some quick points on providing access. Physical materials. We want to make sure that we have materials that are accessible by all. We want physical materials and virtual materials that express the populations that we serve. Accessible collections means displayed in a way that allows materials to be easily found in languages that reflect the various populations, first languages, use of interlibrary loans, and in formats that allow patrons access based on their accessibility needs, such as large print, talking books, or by loan of accessibility tools free of charge. We want to build community. We talk about building community in public libraries, but this is also transferable in carceral environments. You want to make sure your patients feel respected. When a group is respected, they in, in kind will respect the library. So we want to have group programming available. We want to have classes. And just like in public libraries, we want to have patron input into collection development. We want to promote literacy. I put a statistic at the bottom. Approximately 70% of those who are incarcerated cannot read above a fourth grade level. That makes literacy the number one goal for any library, whether it's public, carceral, or otherwise. We want to make sure that traditional literacy is first and foremost in the, in our, the front of our minds. We want to have books that reflect all age groups, all reading levels, we want to have collections and programming that, that go to towards literacy. We want to have a safe space where people can learn to read because more often than not, that is not happening in the prison systems. Again, I worked as a adult education um, teacher, so I know that literacy classes don't exist and they are first and foremost so important for anyone trying to better themselves and rehabilitate. 
And the biggest thing after that is digital literacy. Many people who have been incarcerated for any number of time, number number of years, do not have the computer skills needed to, to succeed on the street, which is the term. So we use it in the world, out in behind bars, inside and on the street. And finally, you wanna protect rights, the right to read. You wanna have degree holding librarians that can fight for the rights of your patrons. And you wanna make sure that librarians have input, if not the final say in any, any literature review process. And I'll pass it along now to my colleague, Brian Smith. Brian, I can't hear you. anything. Your mic's on, is your mic on? Well, oh, sorry about that. I had to mute myself. My uh, stepson was blowing snow on the driveway back there. So uh, we got a little snow last night. Anyway, uh, my name is Brian Smith. I am uh, currently the uh, library manager at the Chippewa Correctional Facility in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan here. And uh, before that, I had the honor of working as a regional librarian and a tester and a volunteer coordinator. I had three job titles while I worked. Is there any way I can see the slide more? Let's see. There we go. Oh, no, nope, that's not what I want. I'll get those slides back on. One drawback of working in prisons is there's no technology, so my technology skills have diminished over the years. But there we go. All right, now I can see the slide. That's much better. Okay, so previously I worked uh, with the Florida Department of Corrections Region 4, which was uh, from north of or is from north of Lake Okeechobee all the way down to Homestead and from the Gulf Coast to the Atlantic. So I had a very large geographic region. There was nine facilities there that I was responsible for making sure that the libraries we're passing the audits, the ACA audits, and also I was doing GD testing, tape testing, and trying to get volunteers to come into the libraries to have some important programming. I was trying to work with Florida Atlantic University, and then COVID happened. So uh, that's how I, my time ended there in Florida, ended up in Michigan afterwards. So while while there, there was a Sago Palm Reentry Center in Palm Beach County, which is not too far from where our headquarters was in West Palm Beach. And I would go there approximately once a month. I had to go to each facility in my region approximately once a month for site visits. And I noticed that some of the clerks that worked in the library there were very passionate about reading. They always wanted to talk to me about books they were reading. And they were kind of sad because the budget for books was non-existent. The only way I was getting any books into any of these facilities in my region was by going to public libraries in Palm Beach County, the wealthier libraries, and getting their old leftover books they didn't want anymore putting them in the trunk of my government vehicle and then driving them around to the facilities and dropping them off, which was very cumbersome. So um, I'm going to try and keep this brief. I do tend to talk a lot. So if anybody has any questions about any of my experiences, feel free to email me and you'll see that I'm willing to share anything uh, pretty much about my experiences. So anyway, um, I was using the Palm Beach County Library System. They had this book club kits that they were using for the public, the general public there. I worked for the Palm Beach County Library System also for uh, almost four years. And so I knew about these book club kits and I had a former coworker who I was friendly with and I contacted her and I said, hey, you know, I'd really like to start doing book clubs in this reentry center. These guys are gonna be coming out to society soon. They're all local. They're from either Palm Beach County, Miami-Dade County or, or Broward County. And so they're gonna be like our neighbors and I'd like for them to have some positive experiences while they're incarcerated before they hit the street. And so she was like, no problem. You can totally check these books out. And so I would bring the list over to Sago Palm Reentry Center to the clerks that work there, incarcerated clerks, and also the uh, residents there. And they would choose, you know, they would rank them like these are the books that we would like to use. So approximately once a month, we would have a book discussion, choosing these books or using these books. And I found this to be very, uh, it was just good for me because it was doing something positive. There's there's so much negativity in prisons and working in prisons and being regional, seeing the differences between all the prisons. Like some of them had more gangs than others and some of them had like like worse facilities than others, et cetera, et cetera. So for me to be able to do something positive was really good for me um, as a person and for my career too. So next slide, please. I also coordinated with a librarian that I met at the Florida Library Association annual conference one year, and he was a public librarian with the Miami-Dade public library system. And I told him, you know, a lot of these guys that are going to be getting released soon, they have questions about 
getting back into society? How do I get a driver's license? How do I get a state ID? How do I find a place to live? I don't want to be under a bridge. I've heard about prisoners getting out and, you know, being under a bridge, having to live under a bridge because there's no place for them to live and they can't afford a place to live, you know, stuff like that. Or so I, my idea was basically that they could write a letter uh, since they couldn't really use JPay for this. JPay is very uh, involved process in order for the librarian in the Miami Dade system to communicate with the prisoners. So we were just using snail mail, good old snail mail. And I just posted the address and the, and the librarian's name and uh, the prisons that were in Miami Dade County, which were Dade, Homestead, Everglades and Everglades Reentry Center, another reentry center. So these prisoners, uh, these incarcerated individuals were able to write to this public librarian. And my hope was that they would learn that, hey, public libraries are here to help. Public libraries are a safe place for me to go. Once I get released back into society, I can come in there, I can get a library card, I can look for a job on the computer, you know, internet, there's air conditioning, which is vital in uh, South Florida, especially in the summertime. And so I was just trying to bridge the divide there. Having previously been a public librarian for about 12 years, I'd always try to find ways as a public librarian to, to give back more. And that's how I ended up working for the Florida Department of Corrections. I didn't feel like I was making a difference in public libraries anymore. And so I specifically took this job because I wanted to do something. I want to put my money where my mouth was basically, you know, like, so. And then uh, I now work at the Michigan Department of Corrections and I'm the librarian manager there. And we are currently purchasing book club sets for our libraries. So we have a little bit more money in Michigan than I did in Florida. And so we have now purchased about six book club sets that we're sharing between libraries. We have two libraries at my facility. There are 1,700 incarcerated individuals at my facility right now. And there are two libraries and a reading room. So we're sharing those around and staff, um, me either as a librarian or one of my staff members, a library assistant or library technician are, are hosting these book clubs. I'm also sharing them with the prison next door in, in Kinross across the street. And uh, approximately six book discussions have been hosted since then. I'm also using book bingo as a way to try and get incarcerated individuals who don't, don't like reading, don't know about the library to come into the library. And it's a very simple concept. You, you read a whole row of, of uh, books on specific, you know, like title, yeah, the title has to start with A, you know, the color has to be blue, just kind of silly categories like that, or a book I've never read before, or a book recommended to me by a friend. Once they read a row, they get a prize. Prizes are huge because, you know, these guys don't have a lot of money. So it's just candy, chips, and tuna so far. And it's been very popular. Uh, this has led to an increase in the number of incarcerated individuals coming into the library that typically would not come into the library. And I'm trying to get their reading up. And as people previously discussed, you know, literacy is directly linked to people being incarcerated and having issues once they're uh, released. And can I get the next slide? I think that might be the end of mine. So, oh, okay. This is the last thing I'm currently doing right now is I was lucky enough to find a former English professor from Northern Michigan University who um, is incarcerated on the in the West prison uh, where I'm at right now. And I he came up to me and he approached me and said, I want to teach some, you know, workshops. You know, I used to be an English professor and the guys here are always talking about books, things like that. So what I've been able to do since we don't have a lot of money is I'm finding books, excuse me, that are in the public domain and we're just, you know, they're public domain. We're not using them for, you know, profit or anything like that. So we're printing them off, trying to keep them like a hundred pages or so. And he's currently teaching like a month long to two month long, depending on how long the book is um book discussion and i just pop in every once in a while just to keep an eye out to make sure you know there's no riffraff there's nothing going on in there that's not supposed to be and it's been very um popular very successful a lot of the students that have been in those classes have come up to me and thanked me for allowing it and, and all i'm doing is basically unlocking a classroom across the library for this guy to use for a couple of hours every week but it makes an impact um the next class is going to be on uh, incidents in the life of a slave girl by harriet jacobs and the one that he's currently teaching right now, actually, I think it ended yesterday, is uh, the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. Uh, I don't think I have any more slides. Let's see. Aaron? Okay, that's all I have. Again, like I said, I've got a lot of information. And I talk a lot. So if anybody has any questions. Okay. My name is Suvi Manor, and I'm from the Kinross Correctional Facility in Michigan. I actually got the book 
the sentences that create us um, from Brian. And that's why I, when I started my writing club, which uh, has been going on meeting at least twice a month since October, I told the guys that I might have an opportunity to share some of their writings. And I have lots, but since the guys left me three minutes, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to be sharing much. All right. So um, one of the guys actually wrote about what is something that's in our mission, and that is promoting successful communication and starting to understand each other. And that goes into right into the fact of how people, what the guys called in the world, either don't think about incarcerated people at all, or if they do think about them, they call them convicts and they don't have nothing much positive to think about. And um, during one time, one class, this one younger guy uh, came in and he was really upset. And I just told him, why don't you write about it? Because when I don't feel good, you know, I write things down. And so he did and he gave me the essay and it just shows um, how the difference between being a convict and being a human being human being that's trying to better themselves. And uh, one of the things um, that he mentions is, um, yeah, just becoming, you know, somebody else and becoming a better, better person and being understood. Um, the following is a quote from an essay about self-realization as an attainable goal and uh, finding this balance in life through faith and dharma and joy and happiness through spirituality. The next quote talks about knowledge and seeing through the lens of the incarcerated or free individual in the same light. It can be about life changing. It can be life changing understand, and understanding and growth. Uh, obviously, I have taken direct quotes from these essays, so they may not all be grammatically correct, um, but I am sharing them as they are. Once, um, when I was pretty new in my position, I haven't even been in there for a year, uh, one of the guys was actually arguing with me in the law library about something that I said I couldn't copy because of the MDOC policies, and he was explaining his point of view, and if somebody else could do the whack-a-mole, since I've been admitting people, um, somebody click on admit, nobody sees that, okay. Um, and um, so he actually then has now become a facilitator in my writing club, and he helps find material, highlighting material that we use in our workshops and the classes. And his quote says, the definition of knowledge does not infer whether what is known is correct or erroneous. We're already on slide six. <laughs> All right. So the next quotes are from a um, guy who received their MBA from California Coast University through correspondence courses. And with his daughter, he's actually the co-founder of Anti-Bully Crusaders organization. And um, one of the things that I highlighted was the stigma surrounding incarceration often leads to marginalization and devaluation of knowledge generated within prison walls. Another essay discusses the restrictions on information on self-help. The biggest error in the system following conviction besides the act of over-sentencing has been made in dealing with access to information, education, and programming. Um, the other one talk, is, talks about writing about sharing your knowledge. Never give up, never surrender, or these stories inside you and the things you need to get out will stay buried in your mind. You will take that knowledge to your grave and help no one else. And like I said, I wish I had more time to share the poems and the writings, but I am going to share one of the poems with you, and it's called My Voice Matters Too. Incarcerated voices, silent but strong. In the depths of despair, they sing their song. Knowledge blooms in the darkest of places, in prisons where wisdom leaves traces. Beyond bars and change, they yearn to be seen. Their truths, their struggles, their hopes keen. In every verse, in every rhyme, their resilience echoes through the sands of time. 
defying stigma. They rise above. Their stories, their truths, a testament of love for society to truly understand. Incarcerated citizens, we must lend a hand. Their voices matter. They need to be heard. In the symphony of life, let their chords be stirred. For in their words lies wisdom profound. Incarcerated voices, let their echoes resound. And I'm very interested in talking with anybody who is doing programs in prison. Uh, please email me so we can make this libraries a beacon of hope. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And Sylvie, if you have a, a link to those poems, I'm sure people would really love to read them if you have that. And um, so, are you going to be posting the slides? We will after, when we put everything on the website. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. So if you have questions, please put your questions in the Q&A. If it's not at the bottom of your Zoom, you may have to go to more in the bottom right of your panel. So our next presentation is Prison Book Programs and Mutual Aids as Abolitionist Strategy. This panel will offer an overview of prison book programs and an introduction to the published collection, Book Through Bars, Stories from the Prison Books Movement, which gives history and current state of this mutual aid strategy. Our presenters are Michelle Dillon, the former program coordinator for Books to Prison Seattle, as well as the former public records manager for the Human Rights Defense Center. Maria Marquise, the senior manager for the Free Write Project at Penn, America's Prison and Justice Writing Program, and the lead author of the report, Reading Behind the Bars, an in-depth look at prison censorship. And Alexander Schubert, the program coordinator at Books Beyond Bars, a project run by the Center for the Appellate Litigation, a nonprofit public defense firm where she also is a paralegal on the Youth and Emerging Resentencing Project, which works to reduce harsh sentences for offenders who are 25 at the time of offense. So thank you all, you may begin. Thanks so much, April, um, uh, for that introduction and, and to you and Rachel and Rebecca for organizing and to Rachel for that incredibly um, insightful and inspiring opening. We're really happy to be here today. Um, my name is Moira. I edited uh, the book that we're gonna be talking about and um, and I've also worked, as April indicated, with um, prison book programs for a long time. I know there's some folks here today who have uh, worked with some prison book programs, so I hope we can have some time for questions. Um, Alexandra, can you go to the next slide? Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. There you go. Um, so this is the book um, that just came out um, Friday, six days ago. Um, and it's the first book that um, explains what prison book programs are, why they're needed, some of the challenges they face, and uh, some of the ways that you can um, become involved with them. Um, Michelle wrote a chapter in it. Um, uh, specifically about censorship. And um, we've already kind of touched on censorship in this panel um, uh, with Florida, which Florida has the most extensive title um, list of titles that are banned, twenty over 22,000 individual titles, um, including um, the book that Suvi was talking about, The Sentences That Create Us, it's actually banned in Florida as a threat to security. Um, so prison book programs face those kinds of challenges, but also um, prison book programs face uh, challenges unrelated to content. So just about who sent the book, um, whether it's free, whether it's hardcover, those kinds of things. And so we try to push back against these things in um, various ways. And Michelle will talk briefly about that in the next slide. Hi, everybody. It's so great to see everybody here at 9 a.m. on a Tuesday. Uh, so I first came to the prison book program movement when I was doing my uh, Master of Library and Information Science degree at the University of Washington. And so I've been working with Books to Prisoners Seattle since 2012. And 
for a brief period of time, I was the public records manager at the Human Rights Defense Center, which is headquartered in Florida, and they publish a monthly newsletter called uh, Prison Legal News. But I want to talk a little bit about what prison book programs are. I know that we have a lot of people, as Maura said, who are from these groups. I've seen your names pop up. Uh, the movement started back in the early 1970s when different community members around the country uh, recognized that there was a need for help for people who were incarcerated, that there was a dearth of information going in, that the state of prison libraries wasn't necessarily as supportive as it needed to be for the individuals who were incarcerated. And to combat that, these community members self-organized into small groups, often working with local bookstores or with other 501c3s or community groups to help deliver books directly into the hands of people who are incarcerated upon request. This is a map that was created by a uh, initiative that's happening right now through the San Francisco Public Library, which is trying to gather more data on the status of prison libraries, the status of incarceration around the country, and the different programs like the prison book programs that are trying to help combat the uh, stat status of information inside of prisons and jails. So this can actually be found on the San Francisco Public Library's website. Each of the little book icons here shows one of the different prison book programs around the country. And as you can see, there are dozens of them now self-organized, generally autonomous, generally working off of very small budgets. I would also encourage everybody, if you haven't gone yet, uh, San Francisco Public Library has put up a series of training videos. Some of you in this group right now might actually have contributed to those training videos uh, about helping to provide information to incarcerated patrons. So go check that out. Uh, anyway, I will pass it off to Alexandra to talk about what the day-to-day -day operations are like. Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I am program coordinator for Books Beyond Bars, which is a New York City-based Books Through Bars group. Um, we're a bit different that we are technically um, run by a nonprofit public defender law firm. Um, and so our structure is a little bit different, but I can um, I will speak to kind of the overall sort of way that um, that these programs tend to be run. Um, so the work that prison book programs do can take many different shapes. Um, overall, the structure involves a group of people who are working to match book requests, which they receive directly from incarcerated individuals, and they try to fill these requests with books that have been donated or purchased by the organization. Um, more often than not, these groups are entirely run by volunteers. Um, so the Books Through Bars group that I work for, as I said, is in a public defender law firm. Um, so I work on the project nearly full time, but I have a group of 13 volunteers who help me to to um, fulfill these orders each week, without whom it just would not be possible um, to do this. Um, so the beauty of these programs and how they tie into abolitionism is that by listening to the information needs of incarcerated individuals, we can defy the dehumanizing models of incarceration that have long been perpetuated by our society, which neglects the systemic issues that face incarcerated people, models which um, dictate the, that the purpose of incarceration is for rehabilitation or punishment, um, which often gets perpetuated in the resources that the very limited resources that are available to incarcerated folks. Um, some challenges that we face are um, lack of funds, lack of volunteers, um, restrictions on what can and can't be sent to a certain facility or um, a certain state. Um, fundings is needed in order to pay for postage and, if possible, to purchase any books that can't be supplied with donations. So although many books through bars groups receive generous donations of gently used books from anyone who wishes to donate. Um, the difficulty that we encounter is that there is a mismatch between the requests that we receive and the books that um, we can receive, that we receive as donations. So a good example of this is that 
we receive a lot of requests from incarcerated folks um, for almanacs and urban fiction books, um, but these are items that are rarely donated. Um, and we regularly receive donations of classic novels, poetry books, short story collections. And, you know, some people love to read this, but we don't receive that many requests for these kinds of books. Um, finding enough volunteers can also be an issue and there can be logistical challenges in organizing groups of people, different schedules, different areas of expertise and levels of experience. And most groups struggle to fill the large number of requests that they receive since there's such a vast need to be filled by a relatively small amount of resources, as Michelle mentioned earlier. Um, restrictions based on facility and state uh, can also be a huge barrier for books through bars groups. Um, so the group that I run only sends books to New York State, um, which is a state with fewer restrictions than say Texas or Florida, as we've mentioned. Um, so we are lucky to only get a few books back sent each sent back each month, whereas other books through bars group that sends that send books to other states um, have to really comb through a lot of very restrictive and inconsistent policies about what books they can and cannot send. And so on the topic of these facility restrictions, um, New York State is one of the many states that has a policy on the kind of content that can and cannot be sent. And often these guidelines can be interpreted really loosely and in different ways, depending on the facility. Um, a few months ago, um, just to show you an example, Books Beyond Bars received a notice from the Eastern Correctional Facility, which deemed Native Son by Richard Wright a um, classic of Black fiction, um, which tells the story of a Black youth living in poverty in Chicago. Um, and they basically told us that this was in violation, that this book was in violation of the guidelines. Um, the reasons they cited were that they said in cites violence based on race, religion, sexual preference, creed, or nationality, referencing pages in which a rape and murders take place, keeping in mind that this is a work of fiction featuring historically contextualized violence, uh, which is clearly a massive distinction from a work of fiction advocating for violence. Um, we contested this decision and the review committee rejected it. You can see the rejection cited here and they this time cited an entirely different reason saying that the scene depicting a rape and murder were describing sadism and or masochism in a patently offensive way, despite these guidelines supposedly only being applicable um, if a publication lacks um, serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value, um, which clearly should not be applied to a novel that Time Magazine included in its list of 100 best English language novels. Um, and so you can see this decision here, and I'll pass off to Moira to talk about some other examples of, of censorship. Um, I think the next slide is for um, Michelle, actually. Yeah, uh, just sort of piggybacking off of that, some of the rejections that we get at Books to Prisoners Seattle are absolutely flabbergasting. Here was one that we received a few years ago from a prison in Tennessee who simply wrote, Malcolm X, not allowed. A lot of the rejections that we get seem to be motivated by the needs and identity of the intended recipient. A few years ago, a few uh, people from different prison book programs actually got together to co-author an article about this, systemic oppression and uh, the contested ground of access to information for incarcerated people that details all the ways that our groups have seen targeted bans, whether it's for gender identity, uh, racial identity, political identity, you name it, we have seen the gamut. Now, what's interesting about this rejection is that we got it to go public. We put it out on social media and we got some uh, journalists to pick up on it. We ended up getting uh, an editorial out in the Washington Post talking about it. And what we've seen time and time again is the only way a lot of the times to combat these really malicious bans is to get the public engaged 
and to get people talking about it. As soon as you can get the public tide turned, we can start to get some accountability for what's happening inside of the prison system. And I will pass it on to Maura. Yeah, so the content bans are definitely troublesome, um, but also troublesome from an abolitionist perspective is the content neutral uh, censorship that occurs. Because prison book programs are mutual aid, um, they aim to undercut what Rachel was talking about, the organized abandonment of people, um, especially the underfunding of prison libraries, the fact that prison libraries don't have you know, money to purchase new books a lot of the time. The fact that incarcerated people are paid cents on the hour, if that, um, for their labor, and then required to purchase brand new books at regular retail prices from major retailers like Barnes and Noble and Amazon in order to get them. So free books are frequently targeted. And um, this was a package that was returned to Seattle Books to Prisoners, the program that Michelle worked in for so many years. And um, they rejected it simply because they didn't want to open the package. Um, so we can see that um, staff in um, prison mailrooms, um, you know, they have an enormous amount of leeway in rejecting this stuff. And it's something that we should um, push back against because clearly this is um, censorship um, and, and not serving people who are inside. Alexandra? Um, so I think uh, Rachel was kind enough to drop a link in the chat to the report um, that, um, you know, really gives like way more in-depth uh, information about censorship than we have time to discuss here. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, an abolitionist strategy, I think, you know, we can we can obviously talk about a lot of priorities um, for people behind bars in terms of their well-being, um, their civil rights, and all kinds of other things. But um, as far as uh, you know, access to literature is concerned, the overwhelming rationale, um, you know, for for content neutral censorship for denying people access to books, period, regardless of what the content is, dictionaries, Bibles, it doesn't matter. Um, claims to be that um, it's a concern for their safety. Um, DOCs routinely say that contraband comes in through the mail when they are actually forced to, um, you know, present evidence for that in court, they don't have it. So we should really, really deeply question that and see this as a, um, a strategy designed to reinforce the, um, the artificial scarcity um, that in, in, um, prisons that really is, um, you know, something that abolitionists can combat through through mutual aid, aid strategies. Um, and I think that, Michelle? Yeah, I'll jump in. So I suppose the central thesis of what we're talking about today is exactly what we've been outlining, right? Prison book programs exist because we want to connect to individuals who have been hidden away and oftentimes cut off from the rest of society. We're attempting to alleviate the scarcity of information that has been built into the prison system. And then we're also a byproduct of what we do, we found as we work in these prison book programs, is that we bring more people into the fold. Books seem like a relatively innocuous platform, right? It's really hard to argue that people shouldn't be allowed to read. And what I've seen at Books to Prisoners is that you'll get people who come in, whether it's for a school project or just, you know, they saw that there is a program that's helping to send books and they love books and they want to help with that program. And it's an entry point to get them talking about the vast injustices that exist in other areas of the prison system. And through that, prison book programs can actually engage with community members to get them more on board with abolitionist principles in general and why we need to fight back against the prison industrial complex. If you'll go to the next slide, we also have some thank you letters that we've received that point to the ways that prison book programs have helped inside of carceral facilities. This was one that was received by uh, Books to Prisoners Seattle. And it, in a gist, it's just saying that it helped to, uh, the books that we've sent helped to alleviate the loneliness and disconnect 
And also the books that were received by this individual were passed along to other people in his flock, which means that we're actually helping people form senses of community within prisons, which is so vital. And I just also want to point out that uh, this person who wrote the thank you letter said that they received an RPG book, a role playing book like Dungeons and Dragons. And we spent many, many days playing and keeping the time occupied. Some of our most requested books at Books to Prison in Seattle are not only the almanacs, like Alexandra said, and dictionaries, which are our number one request, but we get so many requests for Dungeons and Dragons, Pathfinder, other role playing systems. And it makes sense when you think about, again, what the prison system does to individuals and what role playing games, where you sit around with a group of your friends and you spin these fantastical worlds can do to help combat the sense of blankness that often exists within prisons. Uh, and I know that Alexandra has a few more thank you letters. Yeah, I'm really glad that you um, brought up role-playing games. Um, I feel like this is uh, very applicable to this example I wanted to share. So yeah, I'm conscious of the time, but um, we received this really wonderful thank you letter just describing the absolute joy of receiving a package from us. Um, we ordered a specific um, a specific comic called um, a specific graphic novel called Spawn. Um, and he just says, like, when I got the book, I lit up and haven't stopped smiling yet. Thank you so much. And then in the next thank you letter, after he received another book from us, um, he said, again, I can't express how good it feels to receive these graphic novels. And I'm smiling just thinking about it. And then on the illustration to the right, he depicts the characters in this particular graphic novel, uh, like literally transporting uh, the person who's reading it outside of the prison walls. And this is a sentiment that we hear echoed over and over again from the thank you letters we receive. And I just want to share this as an example of how centering the um, incarcerated person's desires of, uh, in terms of reading and prioritizing what exactly they want to read, which you know can be a difficult and sometimes expensive endeavor. It just makes a huge difference and is really a way to engage in resisting um, the poor information environments that exist in um, carceral institutions. Yeah, so to wrap up, um, you know, prison book programs send um, literature based on request. So, um, you know, whatever people want, if they want a role playing game, prison book programs are going to try to send it to them. Um, and um, this this book that I'm dropping the link in the chat um, that, you know, I edited and Michelle contributed a chapter to is the first one to explain what prison book programs are and offer some of the kind of issues that we've been talking about, but also many more um, and um, offer ways to get involved. So we think that this is a an abolitionist strategy because um, mutual aid combats some of the, you know, um, dehumanization that, uh, you know, occurs when people are just denied their basic humanity and um, access to reading is is one of those things. So we look forward to your questions. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Those were both excellent. Um, I have a couple questions. So if you have uh, a question, go ahead and put it in the Q&A. We're going to go a little over since we started a little late. So we, we have time. So the first question is for um, all three of you who just presented. Have any of your programs thought about partnering with public libraries to post wish lists of books? There's a lot of um, prison libraries that do not um, accept donations. In fact, state policy documents prohibit prison libraries in a lot of places from accepting donated books. Um, and again, the rationale is security. Um, so, you know, they won't take something, they won't take donated books because there's going to be contraband in them, um, which is prison speak for anything that isn't, you know, explicitly prohibited. So a postcard inside a book could be considered like contraband and the book is um, rejected. We are also increasingly seeing very um, unscientific methods for scanning books, um, like putting them under red and black lights and looking for spots or markings 
which could be coffee or water or Windex spray, and then claiming that that book is has drugs in it. Um, and prison book programs have been getting borderline threatening communications from Department of uh, Corrections throughout the US about, you know, alleging that they're sending in contraband. So this is something we really need to push back against as a community. The idea that, um, you know, people who are are volunteering their time and energy to send books to people would use that as a conduit to somehow, for some reason, pass drugs to folks is really a uh, specious logic. And um, if we all kind of speak out against that, I think we can have more flexibility partnering with libraries and accepting donated books. But right now, prisons are a closed system. They don't allow outside things in. Everything is seen as a threat. Yeah, but I just want to second that at my facility, they throw them in the trash. They don't even send them back. I got a donation from um, like a yoga place that was getting rid of like the rest of their books. I thought they were new. Well, they had thrown them away. They never even told me. That breaks my heart. I guess this kind of ties into it. So the places that do accept donations or even sending books to inmates, you know, I've had family in prison and when you try to look at the rules of what can be sent and not sent, it's so arbitrary, so vague. And it's almost to the point of, even as a librarian, where I'm like, well, I'm just not going to send anything because everything could fall under these rules. Do you think that part, uh, part of that is the intention not to send stuff in to make it so hard for people to send things? I would say absolutely. And we unfortunately at Books to Prison in Seattle spend a lot of time self-censoring, having discussions among the volunteers. Is this going to be considered too graphic for especially this state in particular? Because the rules not only vary state by state, but oftentimes prison by prison. Like, are there more lenient people in the mailroom that we've noticed at this prison versus that prison? Do we have an in with this prison versus that prison? We think that maybe we'll be able to get a more quote unquote salacious graphic novel or urban fiction book into the hands of the person who is being incarcerated there versus another location. And yes, I would say that overall, making the kinds of rules that are in place that are incredibly vague, that oftentimes do not even come with any sort of oversight, like not even a publication review committee or in Alaska where they don't even keep track of the names of the books that they've rejected. Like that, that is designed to stymie people from sending in books. And as we touched on before, there's content-based versus content-neutral censorship, and the content-neutral censorship is a censorship that is aimed at entire bookstores or prison programs as an entity that restrict who can actually send books into prisons to a handful of sources, generally Amazon or some of the other big name places, and that impacts how people are able to receive books. It's just a mess <laughs> to sum up. I I totally want to, you know, thanks, Michelle, for that. I just I want to emphasize that I think the solution to this problem is not greater consistency. Um, we don't by pointing out the arbitrary nature of how things are um, denied. We are not saying that what we need are clearer rules because um, the rules are actually used to prevent things from coming in. Why is there so much of an emphasis on preventing people from reading? This is antithetical to the purported- It's easier to thing. control people who don't know anything. It's just for control, for locking them up like animals. Right, but if we're gonna have a conversation like, you know, in general culture, just saying you claim prisons are rehabilitative, that's what the claim is. So what role does preventing people from reading play in that? I really think we need to push this because the found, you know, the it is arbitrary. It's totally a mess. As Michelle said, it's like maddening and infuriating, but we don't want the solution to be, okay, sure. We'll just delineate exactly what you can send in, right? 
Because what they're going to say is going to be like, I mean, you know, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld the ban on Dungeons and Dragons as a threat to security. We're not we're not empowering them anymore for, you know, for the censorship. We want to we want to shift the um, conversation away from these ridiculously specious arguments to something that's more substantive. Right. And, you know, we see this nowadays with when we talk about bans in schools. It's the people that don't have the knowledge, don't have the education or being the ones in control. So, and this has again been happening in the prison systems throughout the United States and I'm sure elsewhere as well, forever. And so until we have a push towards putting people in positions of power that have the knowledge, have the background, that's not gonna change. And rehabilitation is such a, you know, a trigger word and it's just not happening. You don't give them the ability to rehabilitate or they're self rehabilitating because we don't have the programming and we don't have the people in, in charge that are pro programming that understand what programming is and what can be and the access to these library materials can be. You know, the state of Florida, like, you know, I was at once an institution for the three years that I was incarcerated and I saw the workarounds that my incarcerated um, friends were able to do to get classes that they facilitated. You know, it's, it's incarcerated and rehabilitating the incarcerated. It's not the, the, the institution itself. It's we're helping each other get better or to rehabilitate or get education or something. We're taking the initiative ourselves to do this and we work the system because a lot of people have been, you know, down is the term 20 years, 30 years, they build rapport or they understand the system for so long that they're able to create these classes and get them approved so we can help each other when we re get released. All right. We are out of time. I want to thank all of our presenters. Um, I'm sure we all could have went another hour talking about this because I still have like 30 questions of my own. Uh, but I appreciate your time. Um, we will try to get this recording up probably in April sometime. Um, our next session is going to be at 1010. So we got about three minutes if you just want to hang out. That session is going to be prison book bans, how the Texas prison system denies incarcerated women in the LGBTQ plus communities their own experiences. So we encourage you to stick around for that one.